We begin this week with Dick Durbin, Senator from Illinois, who's up for re-election this year. Dick, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Bill. Lately, I see you've been expressing some doubts about mandatory minimum prison terms. What's this all about? It's been 30 years since we started uh, getting tough uh, and saying judges really we politicians can make these decisions better than you can. That's right. And we feel better about these mandatory minimums. And I think now we're reflecting on the fact that um, we've gone too far. We've seen in the last 30 years the federal prison population increase by 500 percent. We've seen the cost of incarceration to the federal government go up by 1,100 percent. And frankly, we've gone too far. There are some crimes, particularly nonviolent drug offenses, that don't involve a gang, a firearm, uh, or violence that really should be treated differently. Many of these people are suffering an addiction. It may be their first crime. Some of them are put away for years and years and years. It cost us $30,000 $30, a year for each federal prisoner. So now it's interesting, Bill. Uh, what a coalition uh, that's come together, Democrats and Republicans. The most conservative Republican senators are joining me in a reform bill. We, I think both sides agree. It's time to take another look at this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work? Well, it works in this respect. Uh, those who are accused are off the street. Right. But in terms of reducing uh, uh, the crime, uh, reducing drug usage, it doesn't work very well. We see street uh, drugs now cheaper than ever, uh, and we find ourselves still fighting away. Think about this for a second. All the violence uh, in Chicago that was addressed by the Chicago Police Department involved a um, hundred million dollars worth of overtime. Uh, Superintendent McCarthy, Mayor Emanuel, they picked the areas that were the most problematic and flooded them uh, with law enforcement officers right. and brought the crime rate down to their credit. We need to make sure those resources for law enforcement to keep neighborhoods and communities safe are there. Instead, we're plowing them into sentences for drug offenses which go way too long. Uh, I think there are much better ways to keep our streets safe and better ways to deal with drug addiction. Now you mentioned the Mayor McCarthy. They argue that mandatory minimums for illegal possession of a firearm is a good idea because it would not only keep the bad guy off the street, but it would, you know, in some cases, protect people who are victims. By Whether you agree or disagree with that position, yeah. what we're talking about doesn't touch it. If you're dealing with a crime with a firearm, you're not going to get uh, this reform treatment we're talking about. Strictly nonviolent, no firearm, no gang, drug offenses. Those are the only categories that we're dealing right. with. So do you support mandatory minimums for illegal possession of a firearm? I have supported mandatory minimums in some cases. Uh, and I will tell you uh, that I think we need to increase the penalties for such things as straw purchasing. Uh, when it comes to uh, coming down hard on firearms, you bet I'm for that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a mandatory minimum sentence, uh, you know, I want to sit down and go through and really look at where we are today. But for example, I joined with uh, Senator Kirk, bipartisan effort, to say that if you are the girlfriend who doesn't have a criminal record, buying a firearm for the boyfriend who does, we're going to throw the book at you. A really tough treatment. Uh, we, we almost passed it. We just needed a couple more votes to get it passed in the Senate. But I think going after that misuse of firearms, those who try to buy them in those circumstances, uh, really is the right thing to do. Uh, the minimum wage, Senator Durbin, I, looks like you Democrats are going to make a big issue out of this here in the spring in Washington. Here's what it comes down to, Bill. We haven't really touched this for seven years. Uh, and as a result, a lot of people who go to work and work hard every single day can't make it. They're living paycheck to paycheck. And it doesn't take many family tragedies or challenges to put them in a terrible position. So our belief is if you're willing to get up and go to work, you should be able to live uh, a decent life and not be in, po in poverty. The $7.50, uh, 25 cents uh, nationally uh, is not enough. We're at $8.50 here, if I'm eight and a quarter here. I'm trying to recall whether it's a quarter or 50 cents, but it's difference of a dollar uh, in our state. It's a little better. If we can move up phasing it in over several years to a higher minimum wage, I think it's going to mean uh, that we're going to have people able to get by a little better. And secondly, they're going to spend the money. They're going to need goods and services. It's going to help businesses by having these working families 
who are living close to the edge with more money to spend. But the other side says the opposite is the case. It hurts the economy and causes especially small business to hire fewer people. Well, I will tell you that there are plenty of studies on both sides. Most of them come down with the argument that it's better to raise the minimum wage over a longer period of time, that the job loss is incidental or small compared to the benefits that come out of it. When families have enough to get by, they don't need more government benefits. Why families who are working full time still need food stamps ought to be the issue here. And what we're dealing with are folks that just don't have enough money. So where do they turn to make sure their kids have enough food on the table? The government. Who pays for the government program? All the taxpayers. Taxpayers are subsidizing low wage income uh, jobs. And that to me ought to come to an end. You know, we ought to be willing to pay a nickel more for a hamburger or whatever it might be so that people make a decent living. It's not too much to ask.